Perhaps it's true that only the gods can save us now. But are they listening? Or have they taken a celestial abode, drifting in timelessness, being in their own perfection, indifferent to the suffering of humanity? Or perhaps they do want to help us. Maybe they are watching this sad earthly scene and wishing that we would only invoke their power. Can we stir them awake? Can we retrace the lost path? Can we remember the sacred vows? If only the gods can save us, then we must ask, are there any left who possess the spiritual virility needed for this critical task? Once upon a time, there lived a holy race of people without kings, who possessed a sacred science centuries old. Such was their spiritual virility that they could command the gods through the power of the right, and the gods would bow before them. Through their magic, they had become like gods themselves, marching as heroes upwards towards the heavens. But over the eons, as the Golden Age faded to silver, then to bronze, then to iron, their power waned, their secrets were lost, and the ravages of time left only their calcified remains. Like the legacy of kings, the idea of magic has also captured the imaginations of many an artist or storyteller. There is something in our collective unconscious that compels us to be drawn to the idea that there is some mystical force that we could conduct with the wave of a wand or a secret incantation. The archetype of the magician manifests itself in myths and legends throughout the ages in both positive and negative forms. The pure archetype of the magician is represented well in the major arcana of the tarot. He is the connection between the spiritual and the material realms, the conduit for supernatural energies to manifest in the physical plane. He holds a wand, a polar symbol, representing that he is the bridge to the divine realms. The Ouroboros he wears as a belt and the infinity symbol above his head represent the unlimited potential that his spiritual virility grants him access to, but also the eternity of attainment in the spirit. His positioning, with one arm raised to the sky and the other pointing to the ground, convey the hermetic principle, as above, so below. The magician's duty is in service to Dharma, and he is to use his power to manifest the law from above into the material world below. He seeks transformation and a deep connection to the transcendent. The magician of the tarot is a card of action, spiritual strength, and will. It is this archetype which the Golden Age priests reflected. Thus, when we speak of magicians, we speak of the priestly caste, and when we speak of magic, we are in fact referring to the awesome and fearsome power of the right, which they alone wielded, bringing the divine down to earth for the benefit of everyone. Evola says, magic in this context designates a special attitude towards spiritual reality itself, an attitude of centrality that is closely related to the regal tradition and initiation.
This naturally raises the question as to the nature of these magical energies, which no doubt sounds far-fetched to the modern mind, but was not only believed in, but indeed invoked, channeled and experienced by the priests in their function as the bridge between worlds. The source of this magic was the Newman. Evola says, What characterizes the primordial times is not animism, the idea that an anima is the foundation of the general representation of the divine and of the various forces at work in the universe, but rather the idea or perception of pure powers adequately represented by the Roman view of the noumen. The noumen, unlike the notion of Deus as it later came to be understood, is not a being or a person, but a sheer power that is capable of producing effects, of acting, and of manifesting itself. The sense of the real presence of such powers, or noumena, as something simultaneously transcendent and yet imminent, marvelous yet fearful, constituted the substance of the original experience of the sacred. When most people conceptualize a god, they will often think of the god in anthropomorphic terms, where they envisage the god in a human form or as having human qualities of personality or emotions. This way of thinking about a god is more in line with the concept of the deus. Evola says that the esoteric doctrines teach that these objectified forms of the deities were representations of superhuman and super-rational states, the archetypes of which manifest in an imminent way inside those who undergo the ontological change in their nature brought about by initiation. However, the rites acted upon the primordial substratum of the divine, the noumen, which is not personified or individualized in any way, but rather the supernatural power, a cosmic energy, and the pure, distilled essence of divinity. It is this power that the priests of old invoked in their rites. It is for this reason that the power of the rite was said to be impartial as the Newman has no morality attached to it, no pathos or reciprocal affection such as there might be between God and man. Evola says that praying before the power of the Newman would be like praying to a machine. Like a machine, to act upon the Newman and invoke its power required a certain set of operations to be followed within the bounds of inflexible spiritual laws. Only a right action could achieve a right result, much like one cannot operate a computer if one does not know how to turn it on. Praying to the computer to turn itself on would have no effect. So too is the Newman inaccessible to one who does not know how to connect the power or know the right actions and invocations to direct it. For this reason, the rites were to be followed ea strictum. Not even one detail was to be changed, lest the rite become corrupted, which would at the least render the rite inefficacious, or at worst have devastating results. In fact, we can even think of the Newman like electricity. We can understand that there are unconscious electric fields in the air all around us, even though we cannot see them. We also know that if we had a way to conduct this invisible energy, we could create a spark or draw upon its power. If one decides to fly a kite with a key attached to it during a storm, as Benjamin Franklin was rumored to have done, the principle under which they will attract lightning and draw that electricity to them has nothing to do with that person's motivations, passions, or character. If the scientific principles are correctly applied, the person, good or evil, will be successful in their experiment. 
The Newman functions in a similar way. If the person performing the rite has sufficient spiritual virility and follows the procedure accurately, it does not matter to the Newman how sincere or how well-intentioned that person is, they will be able to produce the desired outcome from the ritual. By acting upon the Newman, the priests could invoke a personified deity. As every ritual was in essence a reenactment of the story of a particular god, the ritual reenactment invigorated and breathed new life into the god and drew that consciousness to wherever the rite was being performed. In a sense, the gods are a personification of the ritual action, which uses the Newman to continually regenerate the moment of that god's creation. This was a mutually beneficial and reciprocal relationship between gods and men, and indeed the ritual was considered a sacred duty owed to the gods, where the concept of sacrilege or impiety had nothing to do with one's personal beliefs in some dogma, but in neglecting the rites in some way. Evola says, Thus, in the older Indo-Aryan view of the world, only the Brahmana caste, consisting as it did of superior natures, could tower over everybody else since it ruled over the power of the right, or of Brahman understood in this context as the vital and primordial principle. The gods themselves, when they are not personifications of the ritual action, that is, beings who are actualized or renewed by this action, are spiritual forces that bow before this caste. Evola also mentions that in ancient Egypt, the gods could be threatened with destruction by priests who knew special incantations. This seems to stand in contradiction with the more common modern view of deities as being supremely more powerful than humans. But when one thinks of the ritual as a reciprocal action, it is easier to understand the balance of power, as well as why it was so essential that the priests be of a superior virility. All of this naturally gives rise to the question of black magicians who would use their power over the Newman for evil purposes. Many of the esoteric teachings provide a path for us to become like gods ourselves in some way, as the initiatic process causes the aspirant to undergo ontological changes designed to bring about that very state of being, to embody in an imminent way certain divine qualities. It is this essence of the living presence of the divine that renders the sacred king worthy of the throne, and it is that same essence that underpins the spiritual virility required to safely conduct the rites in the first place. How could a person slip through the cracks of such a rigorous process and turn away from the light? One must understand that it is the nature of the ego to latch onto anything it can, and that our true self is always in a battle against our ego self, which seeks to draw us back into the illusion of materiality and separate us from the divine. One can imagine that there would be great temptation for a priest who is performing the rites to think, this power is mine, rather than, this power is using me as a conduit. So cleverly and quietly does the ego operate that one could be unaware of its subtle designs. Consider Saruman from the Lord of the Rings, who is the leader of the race of wizards sent by the gods to challenge the evil Sauron. Saruman was once great and described as having the kind of nobility that none would dare raise a hand against, the same kind of regality and gravitas possessed by a sacred king whose spiritual might is so great that he disarms his adversaries without a fight. But eventually, Saruman began to desire the power of Sauron for himself, believing that he would use it to do good. And thus, his ego crept in and tricked him, allowing him to believe he was still on the side of good, while his ego surreptitiously and unwittingly served evil. Saruman's failure to control his ego resulted in him being subsumed by the will of Sauron, to the point that his own individual will was lost, and he became totally committed to the darkness. 
This theme is repeated as a warning throughout the religious mythologies of the world. The danger of the ego to lead one to ruin is not to be underestimated. In his book, The Doctrine of Awakening, Evola relates the story of the Buddha's visit to Brahma, the God Most High, beyond whom there is no higher liberation. The Buddha challenges Brahma, telling him that he too is a victim of illusion, of conditioned existence known as samsara. Mara, the god of death, intervenes and warns the Buddha that he is speaking to the omnipotent creator of the universe, the father of all that has been and ever will be. He cautions the Buddha to follow the laws of Brahma and says that the path he is treading is littered with the corpses of thousands of monks and priests who came before him and were defeated by their own egos. The Buddha rebukes Mara, noting that the relationship between Mara and Brahma is an interrelated one. The god of death and the god of creation working in tandem to block the pathway of divine knowledge to the great ascetic. These powers being exceptionally difficult to wield successfully, Mara's warning, however self-serving, was ultimately a valid objection to the Buddha's continued apprehension of divine wisdom, normally reserved for the gods themselves. Only the extremely remarkable adept can go beyond the comforts of conformity to reveal divine wisdom. The Buddha was supremely vindicated for having gone beyond the domain of Brahma, as his spiritual ascension succeeded. But the disciple who tries to apprehend the light of the god and fails, falls into ruin and proves through his outcome that he would have been better suited to a more simple spiritual life of devotional worship. Further warnings can be found in the stories of Prometheus, Lucifer, Loki, and more, all of whom represent forces of ego and personal will that threaten the divine order and who ultimately suffer for their hubris. Thus, the magician, who will be subject to great temptations of power, must be ever wary to check his desires and cravings and stay within the bounds of the cosmic laws. The great religions of the world, particularly in their esoteric forms, have all tried to offer man a path to rejoin the divine. There are, however, Promethean overtones when one attempts to overreach and become like the gods without doing the proper work, and one must be cautious of such temptations along the path. It is thus important to distinguish between such a Promethean nature and an Olympian nature. The Olympian is solar in quality, that is, he is the source of his own light. He possesses the luminous centrality and calm dominance of the unmoved mover. His numinous quality provokes both terror and veneration in those who behold him. In him, transcendence and humanity are united. He awakens life and generates a supernatural fire within himself, which is the source of the radiant quality of these solar beings. Prometheus, on the other hand, is known in mythology as the one who stole the fire from the Olympians. Here is the essence of the lunar nature of the Promethean. He cannot generate his own fire. Instead, he must seek it externally. Thus, he takes on a lunar nature. The spiritual centrality of the Promethean has either been lost or degenerated, and as such he does not feel that he is the active center of his own spirituality, but merely contemplates it, studies it, and ultimately fails to translate it into real and efficacious spiritual action. In one of his secondary works, The Synthesis of the Doctrine of the Races, Evola remarks on the modern degenerated priestly caste when he says, the priestly man is lunar in opposition to the regal man. He is the man who in the face of the spirit behaves as a normal woman facing a man, 
i.e. with a sense of submission and devotion, and that the lunar is the dominator who receives the supreme consecration of its power from the other, from a distinct priestly caste which it does not give to itself. In general, the lunar man has spiritually feminine traits. Those with spiritual virility kindle the supernatural fire within themselves, embodying the essence of the divine in an imminent way, as did the ancient sacred kings. But those who are lunar approach the divine in a passive or submissive way, bowing before a power they do not possess and do not understand. This naturally gives rise to the tendency to externalize the divine, where man worships it instead of trying to embody it. Evola writes, When the efficacy of the rite disappeared, man was motivated to give a mythological individuality to those forces with which he had previously dealt according to simple relationships of technique, or which, at most, he had conceived under the species of symbols. Later on, man conceived of these forces in his own image, thus limiting human possibilities. He saw in them personal beings who were more powerful than he was, and who were to be addressed with humility, faith, hope, and fear, not only to receive protection and success, but also liberation and salus, in its double meaning of health and salvation. This process of externalizing and anthropomorphizing the divine began the descent into lunar forms of spirituality. When one externalizes God and makes him the other, the power of the divine is then out of reach. When God, in all his various aspects and incarnations, are seen as symbolic of superhuman states of being, then it becomes accessible to us internally if we are of a solar orientation. The lunar man, however, can only approach the divine in a state of supplication, as a beggar in need of warmth. However, when the mysteries of the rite became corrupted and disappeared, the doorways that man used to use to give him access to these supernatural energies and states of being were all closed to him. The initiatic and esoteric knowledge was lost, and so man was put in a position of needing to externalize God because there was no longer any other means by which to conceive of divinity. Without the right, one cannot gain a solar orientation. As such, we are in an age where our priests are lost in a fog, and false gurus arise to prey upon those seeking to fill their spiritual void. The lost people of the world who are still seeking God are susceptible to being misled. Others instead naturally rebel against religions that have fallen into confusion, dogma, and the darkness of ignorance. Without a pathway to experiential knowledge, religion becomes lost in formalism, where the priests go through the motions of rites that they lack the spiritual virility to conduct in an efficacious manner. The formality of the rite can never generate the mystical experience when it is performed by one lacking in the proper regal qualities that were once commonplace among the priestly caste. What then does this mean for humanity? What are the implications of the loss of the right if one cannot achieve a solar orientation without it? Do we need a prophet to bring it back? There comes a point in time when all things need to be evaluated again. When the energy of the original solar emanation has faded, the light growing dimmer with the passing of each century, the echoes more faint, until finally we cannot perceive the supernatural any longer. 
all falls into darkness and ignorance envelops the world of men, bringing with it the sadness of total isolation from the divine. But the great truth is eternal, and we have a holy longing that brings us back to the source of our own creation again and again, a desire to know the mysteries of the cosmos and our place in it, an urge to peer behind the veil of life and understand more than is normally granted to mere mortals. Such spiritual leaps are best assisted by a culture that encourages and seeks the same goals, but regardless of when it would occur, it would always begin with the efforts of a single prophet, born with special attributes that become fully developed through constant ardent striding. Should such a new solar emanation spring forth from the primordial womb of the earth, or come down from the peaks of Hyperborea, it would illumine a path forward through the morass of deepest ignorance and into the crystal light of pure, radiant truth, calling forth the power of creation once again, sending brilliant rays of wisdom and new hope into the world. A path forward for mankind would be revealed through this spiritual authority, which would be encoded and made imminent through the reborn ritual reenacting the divine brought down to earth and relighting the supernatural fires. of light a glimpse into eternity the immutable force revealing human destiny
dance of life.